What's up guys, welcome back to Newswave. So ever since the PlayStation VR 2 launched last year, it seems like Sony has been doing less and less and less to try to sell the, the headset. And now with a new report from Bloomberg, it seems like the situation around it, I mean, is downright dire. We're gonna go over that though here today. Also, we are gonna be talking about that Star Wars Battlefront Classic Collection as it somehow is getting worse and we're back to even just questioning Aspire's credibility, this time bringing some of the community in for it. And then we're also gonna be talking about a new development kit from Microsoft, a new Xbox dev kit. This one though being, uh, being classified in Korea and makes us wonder what kind of revision Microsoft may have planned. So if you guys enjoy this video, make sure you hit that like button, helps out a ton. And if new here to the Spawn Wave channel, make sure you subscribe down below. And of course, members for the channel do get Newswave early and ad free. If you wanna learn more about that, click the join button down below this video. And we're gonna start today with a new demo that just went live yesterday afternoon. That's for Sandland. This game comes out next month, April 24th. And of course, it is based on the manga that was written and illustrated by Akira Tori. Yama, and we can see the page here, this over on the PlayStation Network. It's also available on the Xbox and on PC through Steam. But this does say that the demo, if you play it and will, and you'll have save data from it and you get the full game, you will have some bonus items that will be unlocked. There's a 30 B grade steel, 30 B grade bolt. And I did check out the demo very briefly. Seems like they just kind of have a desert that you're running around in. You're more or less just kind of getting a feel for the action and the combat and some of the exploration. They have different vehicles you can drive around in, like a mech that you can fly around as well, and you have uh, like like different weapons a attached to them. It is an action RPG, and while we don't really get uh, the, the idea of maybe the direction of, of the story and stuff they'll be approaching here with this demo, it at least gives you an idea of the direction of the game when it comes to the gameplay. So I do recommend checking out, especially if you're thinking about getting the full game here in a few months or so. I mean, you'll just get some extra stuff to start off with, so why not? Also, we got a bit more information from Tom Henderson around the whole PlayStation 5 Pro leak situation. And this time it looks like Sony isn't too happy because we can see this post up over on X where he says, Sony has launched an internal investigation into the leaked documents on Trinity as it leaked during a third party rollout. Not sure on the implications yet as I don't think they can catch one individual, but Sony could reduce its third party developer pool for new tech as a result, as in we're mostly just gonna have our internal studios have early access to this hardware and the third party devs will kind of get it when they when they get it. Although they'll have some large partners, I'm sure that still get access to a lot of these development kits early on, like a, a Take-Two or an EA or a Ubisoft, but not shocking that Sony would see this and go, okay, who is sharing around the portal information? And we'll see if they're able to track down, I guess the person who leaked this info out there. But yeah, when something like this starts going around where there's Tom Henderson and others reporting, Sony is definitely taking notice, so we'll see what comes of that one. Oh, and Hi-Fi Rush is now available on the PlayStation 5, and in fact, reviews went live for it, which on the Xbox Series systems, it was rated at an 87 on Metacritic. I wanna point out that that was on like 56 or so reviews, whereas on the PlayStation 5, at the time of this recording, we have eight, but you can see the review score yeah, it's sitting at a 91. At, maybe that Xbox tax, uh, maybe that's a real thing. No, it's, I think as more and more reviews come in, if we get more, then I can see the review score maybe altering, going down a few points or something. But there, I will say there were many reviewers who pointed out that the DualSense controller did did add something to the experience with, of course, some of the subtle vibrations playing into the just the overall music theme of the game and the speaker on the DualSense. Now, the thing that's interesting to me is, if I'm not mistaken, I believe the PC version of Hi-Fi Rush did have DualSense functionality, so uh, maybe they just didn't play it on PC with the DualSense controller, but uh, hey, I guess it, it really does add a little bit more to the experience or maybe games just review better on the PlayStation 5. Let me know what you think down below in the comments though for Hi-Fi Rush getting above a 90 actually on the PS5. And guys, with some of the quick news out of the way, let's get into the bigger stuff. Let's start right away with Sony and their PlayStation VR 2 headset again that launched last year in February. So we are more than a year out from its launch and I don't really feel like we've had anything groundbreaking for this headset that's really worked to push these units outside, like Gran Turismo, really cool experience. Would I recommend someone buy a headset just for that and maybe the, the Horizon Call of the Mountain? 
Not really. Now there are third party games out there that are really cool as well, but nothing that I think is moving the needle for, for most people. And it looks like Sony might be realizing this as well, at least according to Bloomberg. We can see this posted up by Takashi Machizuki over on X saying exclusive Sony paused PSVR 2 production due to piled up inventory throughout the supply chain. People familiar with the matter told Bloomberg. Now, in the article, he does go over the fact that there have been like 2 million or so of these headsets that have been created and Sony's just backed up with units that are not selling at the pace that they must have been expecting. So they've, according to him, stopped or at least paused production in the supply chain. And the way they, I'm sure he's able to at least surmise and put this together is just by talking to uh, different companies and, and suppliers who would be providing different parts for it. And if they're not getting orders from Sony, well, they're, they're obviously then not producing these units. And the thing with this is, Takashi Matsuzuki has been following the PSVR 2 <laughs> release for quite some time, since even before it came out, if you remember, he talked about the slower pre-order numbers, and and that got a lot of pushback then, even I think Sony kind of mentioned and, and, and pushed back themselves. Is it hard to believe right now, based on what we're seeing with the evidence we have in front of us, uh, with that the PSVR 2 headset could be in a position where it's being paused in production, no, it, it's not hard to believe that. It really isn't. I, look, again, the PSVR 2, while I think in terms of like the, the VR world, when it comes to more like high-end headsets, it, it's priced well. The problem is it's limited to the PlayStation 5 and you have something like the Quest 3, which is all-in-one and provides a, I'll say, good enough experience in many of these games. I think Sony's made many missteps with the headset. One, not providing any big-time first-party game to really push this thing even a year now outside of launch. And two, they've really been dragging their feet on the idea of it working on PC. And now we see a clear push within Sony to get more of their games on PC. You feel like the headset would have been a great idea to have PC compatibility there day one. You would open yourselves up to a large audience of gamers who would probably look at that headset at $550 and say, wow, that's in terms of the parts and the experience I can get out of this, that's pretty good. Now, the one thing I have seen brought up quite a bit on social media as we've had this article make the rounds and the discussion around the headset come up is the idea that there's no backwards compatibility for PSVR 1 games and uh, that just really hurt it. And I will agree, that does hurt it. It's I think based on the way that they designed this headset and the controllers and not having the, you remember they used like the wand and other things. It, the PSVR one was sort of a cobbled together kind of experiment at that time. And I just having backwards compatibility for all these different games that used even different peripherals, I feel like would have been pretty difficult. And I think Sony decided in development to just not even go down that path. But I think it would have been a good idea to at least pick and choose more titles and have them ported forward for people who already own them. The fact that you can't play Astrobot on the, on this PSVR 2 headset, even a year after it's come out is just mind blowing to me. It's like one of the best VR games Sony or really anyone put out at that time. And it's still stuck on that old headset that now most people don't want to go back to. So I don't know if there's much Sony's going to be able to do at this time to really turn things around for PSVR 2 outside of some massive shocking reveals from themselves and of course getting over to PC in a meaningful way. Really just, hey, here's a driver, here's something you download and your PC is ready to go and you can use it on whatever you want. Then maybe they'll have a bit of a spike in sales and they can unload some of apparently this stacked inventory in their warehouses. So... I guess we'll see year coming up with Sony making that push to PC if this PSVR 2 headset is sort of able to get revived that way. Next up, let's talk about that Star Wars Battlefront Classic Collection release from Aspire that just somehow keeps getting worse. This should have been a slam dunk home run release. I mean, you have two classic titles that if they were just functional, people would be excited and thrilled to play and also recommend to all their friends, but that's just not the case. It's just a messy, messy situation right now with the servers, bugs, and apparently them just straight up pulling mods from the community on PC to use in their game. This is a strange one and once again brings up really questions around Aspire 
like, like just in general and some of their credibility and integrity now. Like, okay, so we can see this that was posted up over on X and it's from, I am a, a, sh a shaman, a sh some, of these, some of these X names, these is get me. Maybe I'm just old. I don't know. Uh, it says, seriously, Aspire Media, I'm beginning to feel insulted. Nintendo Switch launched with just straight up all my hero stuff from my mod. Same glitches and bugs. We've we've even data mined it. And it's the exact same files, just using the proper lightsaber attack animations. Now, this is, this is an odd one because developer Aspire insisted the release of Star Wars Battlefront Classic Collection does not include any code or content that is taken from uncredited sources, telling IGN it mistakenly included content that is not in the product after capturing placeholder footage for the trailer last fall. Okay, and, and just to just to point out that I am a, a shaman person, uh, they're not necessarily out there like, hey, you gotta pay me, I'm looking for all the credit, every they're really what they're they're saying is this, of course, brings up question around. Aspire's credibility. How can fans trust a company which doesn't seem to value the fans' passion? And really, with if you, if you think about it with Aspire, they've done some weird stuff, right? Like with the Knights of the Republic 2 situation where they promised this DLC they were going to revive and restore, and then they just didn't after they sold a bunch of copies on that promise, and apparently that's turning into a whole class action lawsuit. But in this case, the... The modding stuff, I know it's already kind of a gray area, so there's probably not much that can be done anyway when, like, Disney would be like, well, you're using our files or game, you're playing around with it. We've seen Capcom push back heavily on uh, on mods. They, they don't like that at all. And I think there are many companies who kind of think that way, even if they don't make it completely public and known. And that's one of the reasons I think in this case they can, of course, say it, they can put a spotlight on it. I just don't know if there's much they can really do and Aspire can just kind of keep going along and working on the Battlefront Classic Collection. It's just not a good look for Aspire and just continues to bring up a lot of questions around the way that they're treating these different releases. Next up, let's talk about Super Mario Maker on the Wii U because there is currently a community-driven effort to complete every single level in Mario Maker. And there's actually just one level left. We can see this post up over on X. This is from Team 0%. Again, the community-driven effort to wipe out all of these Mario Maker levels ahead of the April 8th shutdown for the Wii U online, saying there's one level left. Yamada beat Final Dance, leaving trimming the herbs as the last level left to clear. Okay, well, there you go. So just a call to the community out there, the, the dozen or so Wii U owners who aren't trying this, there, there you go. You can try out trimming the herbs, which apparently is a 10 second level. All right, well, let's see what we, oh, wow. Okay, so this is, you can see it right now as I, I noticed there was a video from the Beast who goes over this. And so in Mario Maker, you have to, of course, be able to complete your level to post it. And the person was able to, to their credit, it looks absolutely ridiculous with the timing. And they do a good job here in this video that I'll source down below really going over why this level, even though it's about 10 seconds long, is so difficult. I mean, it is like perfect input after perfect input after perfect input to where, I mean, it, it, it's like a one in a million percent chance that you'd get this thing at all. And now a tool assisted run, of course, would do it, but the idea is to for them to be able to complete it just outright playing the game normally. And at this point, we're like three weeks out, so the clock is ticking right now. And if you're out there and you think you can beat this level, fire up the Wii U and take a shot because this this is kind of it. If this level gets completed, everyone can sit back and say, okay, we, we zero, or they say team 0%, we've like 100%ed all of Mario Maker, all the levels are done. We don't have to just kind of leave one out there and say, if only. So plug in the Wii U, dust off the gamepad or the pro controller and well, I guess take a shot at trimming the herbs and Mario Maker and see what you can do. And in our last bit of news, let's talk about a new development kit that appears to have been discovered from Microsoft for the Xbox. This was posted up over on X and it's from Korea Xbox News saying, Microsoft's new Xbox dev kit or the XDK console was certified by the National Radio Research Agency in Korea today. This means that you can use the device in Korea. It is likely to be distributed to game developers in Korea soon. 
So this is interesting because, all right, so we believe that there is a discless Xbox that is on the way. We saw that in their plans that were accidentally leaked out during that FTC uh, case that was going on. And then recently we've had a report, I believe, from Xputer, who said that there was still a discless Xbox plan for release over the summer. And actually this certification lines up probably about three or four months from when the certification would go live like this we would see the console at least come out. So this is this is interesting. I do think that maybe June when they have their showcase, they would announce something like this and do that thing where like, oh yeah, it's out in a few weeks in stores or you, really you just go on the Xbox website and order it. And this is for radio research agency, as they point out. I mean, we know, or at least we believe, according to their own documentation with FTC, that they will be upgrading the Wi-Fi and also the, the communication for controllers, that sort of thing. So it makes sense why you would see this, maybe even for a development kit where some of the developers want to play around with some of those aspects just to make sure everything is compatible. I don't believe we are going to see this turn into an Xbox Series X Pro. I think Microsoft, Phil Spencer, has been very upfront that they're just going forward with what they have. And if we are to believe that they're just going to kick off the next generation in 2026, I don't know why they would do a pro system at the end of this year when there's a chance that in 2025 even, they could just start talking about next generation. I mean, if they're coming out holiday 2026, I feel like it would be early 2026, but maybe Game Awards 2025, they show up like they did back with the Series X and they start the next generation with some sort of trailer there. Sarah Bond has mentioned during that Xbox podcast, they did the future of Xbox. They have some exciting hardware still coming up even this holiday. So I assume this would fall in line with it, along with what I believe to be a brand new controller that should introduce a lot of features that we see right now in something like the DualSense controller with that advanced haptic feedback and probably syncing directly to your router and the cloud like we've seen with uh, the, the Google Stadia controller. So we'll keep an eye out for this one. But yeah, it does look like at least something is happening in the background with Microsoft, most likely for that diskless Xbox system. And before we go to the comments of the day, we're gonna take a look at the poll that I posted up yesterday. We ask, which debut Zelda game for a handheld generation is your favorite? Look at that, Link's Awakening. Wow, that is, I, I would, you know, I'm a little surprised on that one. I figured maybe Oracle of Ages or Seasons would have been, I, I guess just Link's Awakening has, has those memories attached. I mean, look, Link Between Worlds, awesome title in the 3DS, and then Minish Cap, Phantom Hourglass, man. Yeah, I, well, hey, the control scheme, I just don't think clicked with everyone necessarily. We've seen some patches that have been released where it, I, th I believe, applies sort of the, the stylus touch screen controls to the d-pad even so that game is just so designed for that con original control scheme you still have to use the touch screen at times but yeah Link's Awakening apparently the most popular handheld Zelda game that debuted on its uh, on its handheld generation and then we'll finish up with the comments of the day we'll start with this one here this is from Zelane who says what perplexes me is that Sony recently announced during their investor meeting they have no plans for any first party games from the ma their major franchise this fiscal year what will they have to offer for the PS5 Pro just patches for older games yeah I think they will have patches so think of the their best looking first party games right now, or even more recent ones. So God of War Ragnarok, that'll probably be a, an example. A Ratchet and Clank, that seems like that's set up perfectly for them to showcase ray tracing, 60 FPS, 4K, probably Spider-Man 2. Now, just because they say there's no games coming for like major first party releases, like doesn't necessarily mean we couldn't see a new intellectual property that could lean into using the PS5 Pro. And something I think would be really cool would be Team Asobi releasing a new title, like, like a new Astro game. And maybe that can lean into using some of the newer technology with the PS5 Pro. I know it's not a major Spider-Man or God of War or something like that, but I think they did a really good job showcasing the dual sense and maybe some of the fast loading for the PS5 when it first came out with Astro's Playroom. I think they do a really cool job showcasing even some of the visual effects with the new system and a bigger budget Astro 3D platformer game would be really, really cool and very different from what we've expected from Sony in the last like seven or eight years. So that's what I'd like to see. But yeah, definitely they're going to lean into using some of their current titles with patches to showcase what the PS5 Pro can do. And then we'll go to a comment from the members video. This is from Dark Type. It says, PS5 Pro, how about lowering the entry price for a PS5 in general? 
Yeah, I hear you on that. We've been so used to the cycle of the systems getting cheaper midway through the generation, whether it's the PS4 Slim, the Xbox 360 Slim, PS3 Slim. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. But we're kind of in this time period where the, the systems just don't get cheaper anymore. Like the Switch is actually more expensive technically with the OLED, but even like the Redbox Switch hasn't gotten cheaper. The battery's gotten better, but typically you'd expect prices just fall over time. And a lot of that has to do with just pricing in general and inflation and things happening behind the scenes, just sourcing some of the supplies not really cooperating with the idea of a price drop. So that's kind of where we are. I feel like we might get right to the end of the generation before Sony starts slashing prices for the PS5. And that legitimately might just be to try to move the rest of their inventory before the PlayStation 6 breaks onto the scene. And ladies and gentlemen, that's gonna do it here for Newswave. If you enjoyed this video, guys, hit that like button. If not, hit the dislike. Leave comments down below about everything we talked about here today. Where's the situation around the PSVR 2 with it reportedly pausing production in the background. Do you think there's anything Sony can do to really get this headset moving along in the market? And then also what about Aspire and the Battlefront situation right now? It, what do you think about Aspire and some of their recent Star Wars releases is what I'll ask there. And then Mario Maker, do you think anyone's gonna be able to beat this incredibly tough level as we count down towards April 8th? Thanks guys for watching and I'll see you next time.